Uh, welcome to Carcon Carne. I'm James Van Hossel. This right here is episode 634 of Carcon Carne, sponsored by our friends at Siren Records in McHenry on Main Street in McHenry. We're recording this on the 15th of July, just two days away from Record Store Day, the blessed event of Record Store Day. If you're going to get those, those exclusive cool things, that Foo Fighters exclusive record, go to Siren Records in McHenry. So, sex work, the stigmas, the realities, the narrative. We're going to get into all of that tonight. My guest is Caitlin Bailey. She's a sex worker rights advocate, host of the podcast, The Oldest Profession. She's a comedian and the star of the one woman show, Whore's Eye View. In her own words, she's waging a stubborn crusade against whorephobia. I think it's cool you're doing podcast interviews. I mean, well, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I would imagine the traditional media outlets are still a little sheepish about addressing any of these things. Well, it's actually interesting that you say that NPR just ran um, an episode on the impact of SESTA FOSTA and they featured a survivor that had been, you know, uh, brought to them essentially by by Swap Behind Bars, which, you know, works with incarcerated sex workers dealing with the, you know, the fallout uh, and the harms caused by this, you know, banana pants crusade we've been on of arresting, you know, consensual adults for engaging in the world's oldest profession. But, you know, she told a really compelling story about the devastation impact of trying to erase sex workers from the internet, which is what happened when Sesta Fosta passed uh, in April 2018. That's, and you know, I think we should stop there because yeah. I, I, I don't, there's not a common bunch of acronyms there. Sure, yes. It, 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 st it stands for um, Stop Enabling Sex Trafficking Act and Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act. And it was sold to the American people as many anti-prostitution, anti-pornography, prohibitionist laws are um, in the name of protecting our children from sexual violence. But instead of targeting uh, what we know to be, uh, you know, um, causes behind uh, desperate people doing desperate things um, in poverty or child pornography, like, uh, you know, breaking up rings like the Catholic Church or reporting abuses and taking uh, revenge porn seriously and listening to survivors of sexual assault. We're not doing any of that. We're trying to erase adult consensual sex workers from the internet by taking down Backpage, taking down Craigslist erotic services, taking down Rent Boy, taking on the places that sex workers had built uh, to schedule and screen their clients. And what happened? It was incredibly predictable. Uh, violence against sex workers went up. Uh, abuse in the sex industry went up. And you saw a huge surge in both arrest and violence in the sex trade, all the direct result of further criminalization. I, I think one of the big obstacles sex workers face is people conflating all sex work with human trafficking. And certainly that existed. That was that could Absolutely. be found that could be found on some of the sites you mentioned. Yeah, the, uh, you know, the conflation between human trafficking and adult consensual sex work, I think, is the problem. You know, there are a lot of smart people out there that are trying to do the right thing and prevent real exploitation and real sexual violence. But this is not a problem that we can arrest our way out of. This is not a matter of rounding up the bad actors here. It's a matter of helping people who are in desperate need. And that means funding domestic violence shelters, funding shelters for queer youth providing safe, non-judgmental places for people to go who are in a desperate situation so that they're not driven into the hands of predators. Sex work, I think, has become a symbol of so much of what we think is actually wrong with the economy. You know, we hate exploitation, but we project all of that hatred into sort of a caricature of prostitution. And in so doing, we erase the voices and the narratives of actual sex workers who have been calling out for our rights for generations now. Why is there such a stigma? Great question. So um, I've nerded out about this for a long time, uh, and I have uh, a, a, an answer. Um, but I, you've got to go back a little ways because it's I'm, I'm a history major, um, and and I, I think of things through a historic lens. And actually, you know, there we had kind of a, a panic about the role of women in society between um, 1870 and I would argue you know, 1920, but people would argue with me and say that, that, that suffrage was essentially this like breaking point of a 
gender panic that we were having because the invention of the bicycle in 1870 allowed women to do a revolutionary thing, which is like go places and do things without the assistance or knowledge uh, of a man. And so that created this sort of existential threat. And right around that time, you also have the emancipation of slavery. We have a, a radical sort of racial reordering that happens. And as the Jim Crow laws descended in the South, you start to see something called the American plan. And it really comes to fruition during World War I. So for the US, that was 1917. And it was just our version of what the British were doing with the Contagious Diseases Acts, right? So in the name of protecting soldiers from venereal disease, we didn't test them for STIs or give them condoms or sex education. We just started rounding up women that we suspected of promiscuity. But this is like promiscuity according to a cop and like cops haven't changed that much. So we're mostly rounding up, right? Women who are in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, a lot of women who said no to sexual advances from cops, um, known sex workers, immigrants, um, you know, poor women, poor working women, women who had a reason to be out and about alone, uh, which was something that we were trying to crack down on. And that's when you start to see the rise of anti-loitering laws and the criminalization of prostitution. You know, sex work isn't really criminalized in this country until the progressive era, right? So we did this at the same time that we prohibited alcohol and abortion for the first time in this country. It all happens around this time. Um, the first sex worker led protest in the US actually doesn't happen until January 25th, 1917. And 300 women marched on a local reformer's home who was claiming that he wanted to save the innocent girls, right? It's the same story. They called it white slavery back then. We call it trafficking now, but it's this sort of uh, whitewashed version of a, a victim that does not reflect the lived reality of, of what this looks like, saying, we want to save girls from the horrors of prostitution. The best way to do that is to shut down the brothels where they work and live. And 300 sex workers had the cojones to show up uh, at 10 a.m. and confront this reverend and say, sir, if you want to help us, what we need is higher wages for women. Uh, and they tried to have that conversation in 1917, but instead they shut down the brothels on Valentine's Day, less than a month later. And sex workers have been on the run, clamoring for our rights ever since. I, I guess it's probably helpful at this point to define what is, <laughs> excuse me, define what a sex worker is. Absolutely. Sex work is a really big umbrella term that means erotic laborers, right? This could mean anything from foot fetish models to Hooters waitresses to porn, porn performers to, you know, full service sex workers to people that do, you know, very, uh, very, you know, it, it, sex work has always been all kinds of people doing all kinds of things for all kinds of reasons. But what differentiates sex work from sex trafficking is the agency. It's the same thing that separates farming from slavery, right? When you have people that are by force, fraud, or coercion, or they're under the age of consent or 18, are, you know, manipulated into a situation where they're exchanging uh, erotic labor on behalf of, you know, an ex exploitative third party, that is and should remain very, very illegal. Um, in this con, and sex workers are banding together on this in part because as we were, you know, uh, the passage of SESTA FOSTA, which is the, the federal law that we were talking about before, has really brought us together because, in order to avoid opening themselves up to liability, platforms are erasing perfectly legal sex workers, right? Porn performers, uh, you know, people who are doing webcam work, people who are working in legally licensed strip clubs are not allowed to post on social media. They're being erased because these platforms don't want the fate of Backpage. They don't want the fate of Craigslist erotic services. And so they are preemptively erasing a pretty broad spectrum of sex workers and performers that don't identify as sex workers and like sexy women that also don't identify as sex workers, but as, you know, influencers or just people like they're being erased and censored from um, the public square in the name of cracking down on prostitution, in the name of cracking down on sex trafficking. And we've seen this story a thousand times before. We saw it with Comstock in the 1870s. We saw it with this reverend and the white slave law in the 1910s uh, and teens. And we ought to recognize it now.
The human trafficking thing is horrific. It's terrifying. I just finished reading, I don't even think it's out yet, a book written by, I think it's the lead attorney who brought down Backpage. And reading that book, it, it, it sounds like every ad that was on that website was a human trafficking, exploitative thing. See, I know I that's not true, but it, it's absolutely not. I, how how do we in the public, I guess, how does the public know the difference? How is that part of the mission is helping people understand yeah, this who, is the, who the bad one people of the, are? One of the downsides of, you know, we know the way that prohibition impacts economies, right? When you criminalize something, you push it into criminal networks. You know, the Stonewall, the famous play, you know, start of the LGBT movement, that bar was owned by the mafia. Not because, you know, gay guys love Italians. It's because gay clubs were illegal. So right. a lot of the horrific abuses that you see in sex work are the direct result of it being pushed underground and criminalized. You give abusers uh, the, the, to the violent tools of the state to keep everyone involved in a state of fear and desperation. And that's a problem that we can solve by stopping the arrests. I'm not suggesting that we legalize or, you know, reduce punishment for rape victims. I'm suggesting that police officers spend their time investigating the rapes that are actually reported instead of setting up months long sting operations where they're spending most of their time watching people get aggressively consensual hand jobs. Aggressively consensual hand jobs. That, that's that's the pull quote. For, for the <laughs> I, what about the European countries that have legalized sex work? What are they doing right and wrong? Yeah. Well, you know, I think that Amsterdam is a really interesting model. Um, it's a it's a form of you know there there are only four ways to police prostitution, right? There's full criminalization, uh, there's um, legalization and regulation, uh, there's um, the end demand model that we can talk about, and then there's full decriminalization. And the problem with the legalization model is the way that it's implemented creates a two tiered. Uh, it doesn't help alleviate any of the abuses of sex work because when you create licensing structures and you empower a small group of people to have a monopoly on legal sex, such as in Nevada and also in Amsterdam, you end up pushing and sort of corralling sex workers into what ends up being a deeply exploitative system. This is the problem with the mega brothels in Amsterdam, and this is certainly the problem with the brothels in Nevada. For example, Nevada is the only state in the union with legal regulated prostitution, and it has the highest arrest rate per capita for prostitution. How does, how does that work? I, I, it's I, I, impossible to work as a legal prostitute in Vegas or Reno, where the highest demand is because of the way that the laws were written. It's impossible to work as a legal prostitute in Nevada if you yourself have ever been arrested for prostitution, which feels bananas to me. It's impossible to work as a legal prostitute in Nevada if you are not willing to register as a licensed prostitute, which is a subpoenable thing about you for the rest of your life. You can imagine how this plays out in child custody cases. Mm. And you're not allowed to work at a brothel that hasn't, that hasn't hired you or that you're not willing to follow the house rules. And because it's so difficult to get a license in Nevada, it's this, you know, network of wealthy and connected overwhelming dudes that run these places and they don't do it with the benefits of their workers in mind. What do you say to someone who's watching right now who just simply doesn't get this? Who just is... Look, I understand that there has been uh, a lot invested in creating a image of prostitution that, you know, creates a visceral response. But I think it's difficult to imagine that something that is older than money is really so unnatural or grotesque. And I would say the one thing that we know is what we're doing now isn't helping anyone. SESTA-FOSTA didn't save a single victim of sex trafficking. In fact, law enforcement agencies from around the country are almost unanimous in saying that the passage made it more difficult to investigate uh, child tra uh, trafficking issues because it pushed that further underground. Yeah, Backpage had a long history of cooperating with law enforcement when there was real evidence of either a minor being involved or abuse. Um, and I would say that it wasn't that long ago that we had a visceral repulsion to the idea of, you know, homosexual sex 
And I think that like this is another thing that we ought to reexamine. It's been it's silly that we're investing real resources in policing the consensual sexual behavior of adults. When I, when I was growing up, I, I couldn't imagine just based on the way the world worked. I couldn't imagine I would see a day when marijuana was legalized. I couldn't imagine a day when same sex marriage became the rule of law. Based on the fact that those two tides turned, do you think there's a chance that sex work could follow suit? I feel like I've studied too much history to be optimistic about this issue. Um, you know, we've come very close uh, and it's definitely been a one step forward, two steps back, not only for, you know, uh, you know criminalized, marginalized groups, but women in general. Uh, you know, it, I think that the crackdown on mostly women body like I mean you really you should really read the laws that are being proposed in some of these states right like there are signs in every hotel in the country warning about what trafficking looks like but one of the things that trafficking looks like is a woman traveling alone with acrylic nails like I don't know how comfortable I am with my neighbors and fellow travelers feeling super comfortable reporting me to the local authorities for having what they determined to be too much sex on vacation like I feel like people are not really thinking through the ramifications of what cracking, quote unquote, tra cracking down on human trafficking as conflated with adult consensual sex work. What kind of existential threat that is to our liberty, our freedom of movement and our freedom of expression in this society. And we've seen it before. We've seen what anti-prostitution laws do to queer communities. We know what anti-prostitution laws does to freedom of movement of women. It wasn't it, immediately after the passage of Sesta Fosta, there was a very nice restaurant on the Upper East Side of Manhattan that stopped serving single women alone at their bar because they didn't want whores in their restaurant. Uh, for those people who are just listening to the podcast, that was my jaw hanging out. <laughs> really? Th that was in the modern day. Yes. Recently. You can I, Google that now. And I just got past the acrylic nails thing. So that this is a lot. This is a it's lot a to lot. Process. It's definitely it's you know, this is a layered issue. I've dedicated over a decade to studying and obsessing and advocating. I've talked to legislators all over the country. I've talked to thought leaders. The World Health Organization, Amnesty International um, are with us on these issues. The only way to support the human rights of sex workers and our most marginalized is to fully decriminalize consensual sex work that frees up law enforcement that enables people that are engaged in this work to report the crimes committed against us and that makes all of us safer and healthier i, I do want to get to and one of the reasons you're here the reason you're here is to talk about the oldest profession podcast i i, I kind of buried the lead i mean there's just so much to talk about with you i, I think a question that people will have as they listen to you as they watch you it, it's probably something you get asked a lot what is it about sex work that made it your vocational calling. Oh, why did I do it? Yeah. Oh, I just have this personality. I, I started doing sex work. Um, I actually started doing sex work the same age that my father was when he joined the army um, against both of our mother's wishes. <laughs> uh, so, you know, um, and I am getting into that in my memoir and my one woman show. So there's a lot of rich themes uh, to explore in my family history. But I, um, I did sex work because people told me that it was the scariest thing I could do as a woman. Um, which I think is very limiting, actually. It wasn't, I've had way better adrenaline highs, uh, you know, doing stand up and traveling. But, uh, but yeah, I, I, there was a taboo around it. I was raised in abstinence only education in, in the South when public schools were paying uh, Baptist ministers to come in and, and do, you know, uh, non uh, abstinence only education at us. And so one of the things that I was told is that, like, every sexual encounter that I had would like diminish or degrade me, that I would like deflate slowly like a balloon over time. And um, there's just no way that's true. And so I became, I became just obsessed with this like obviously dumb lie. Um, and, and uh, you know, as my best friend would say, who's now working with me at Old Pro Productions, like I am an empiricist at heart and sex work felt like, the um the best way to test my theory that uh having sex is fine actually and you can just do that but isn't it true just in a big picture sense anytime someone tells a kid or someone what they can't do they're going to find a way to, to totally or, or or really rock that thing they're told they can't or shouldn't do the, the more the more pushback they get 
Yeah, I had one dumb drunk uncle that was like, you're reading too much. And now look at me. I mean, it's just. <laughs> yeah, you, you, girls aren't supposed to read. They're not supposed to read. They're not supposed to fight. It's a really long list of things we're not supposed to do. So I did the worst thing right away, which was very freeing. Um, and then I came back to sex work a decade later when I was working as a stand up comic in New York, which uh, only pays an exposure and beer tickets for the first right. like, five years. Oh, I, I deal with a lot of local bands. I, I know. Sure. So you get I it. know how that like, economy works. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's a tournament economy. And like I could have waited tables. I did work at Starbucks. Um, I didn't last long. I tutored. I hustled. I did a lot of different kinds of gigs in New York and sex work was one of them. Let's talk about stand up comedy. You talked about the adrenaline rush. I, I definitely think it takes courage. It takes a certain fearlessness to get out on stage. wired weird like it's. Well, I mean, the, the cliche is that everyone who goes into stand up comedy has some kind of deep rooted trauma or unresolved. They say the same thing about sex workers. And it's just like, I don't know, maybe a lot of us are walking around with unexamined trauma. Maybe that's like the, the like the work of life. You know, I don't think that there were I, I'm, I've been looking around like, you know, I don't want to I don't want to be ageist or whatever. But like the boomers went through a lot and they took a lot of it out on their kids. And we're all working on that. <laughs> <laughs> True story. All right. So the podcast is the oldest profession. And as you've already illustrated in this discussion, you're you're a student of history. You, yes. you are fascinated by what came before and it helps inform your understanding of what, what's coming down the road. Uh, you dig into the history of sex work. I, I, I do it with the help of Dr. Charlene Fletcher, who is a PhD historian who is also um, obsessed about the voices that are not often included uh, in you know, Western Civ, the, the voices that are left out of history. Um, and we've, you know, it's been just a joy and a pleasure working with her over the course of the last year. She taught a course at Brown University um, called The Oldest Profession. Um, and she does a deep dive and provides an annotated bibliography that is available on our website that accompanies every episode. So like, uh, you don't have to take my word for it. Well, that's what I was going to get to. It, it doesn't seem like there would be a whole lot of reference material to pull from in order to compile content for the podcast. I mean, it is the oldest profession. So we have been around the whole time. But I mean, about specific women and what they did. It, it... Absolutely. You, it's amazing. You know, historians can be uh, very creative. Uh, there was a, a, um, a book out recently that re-examining the life of um, the victims of Jack the Ripper. And so we did a five part series on the, the known victims. And there's actually a lot available about their life and uh, not all of them were sex workers. And so we talk about that and why uh, we've remembered the story in the way that we have. Um, Victoria Woodhall was the first woman to run for president. She was a sex worker. And there's a lot about her because when you run for president, you sure. produce an archive. And so, you know, there have been we what's true of sex work is what's also true about, you know, other populations that you study, like the wealthier and more of a public person you are, the more of a, a record that you you leave behind. Um, but there have absolutely been sex workers that have been comment upon. I mean, they're in the Bible, you know, like we're we're, lit we're literally story. everywhere. Yeah. Uh, the, the thing about being successful as a podcaster is, you know, everyone in the world has a podcast. As we started talking, 10 more podcasts emerged on, <laughs> on Apple podcast. But I think it's really important to be successful, to have a very definable mm -hmm. edge or corner. And I think you've done that. Thank you. There, yeah, there are we... plenty of sex podcasts out there, but this is. The, this is history. This is specifically yeah. sex work history. So we talk about the first sex worker led protest in this country, which happened January 25th, 1975. And we have like a whole holiday around it. It's amazing. Anyway, so like, you know, we talk about the the legacy that we are all a part of, you know, like soldiers have this um, brew, brewmasters have this, you know, like sex workers are part of a profession that stretches back across generations and we've been you know falsely denigrated we've been dismissed we've been called all kinds of names but a lot of us wrote memoirs and they're awesome i my god one of my favorite sex work related books is sex in the second city written by karen abbott about mm -hmm. the chicago brothel amazing it is so great and, and brothels, I, mean, I mean brothel owners literally built this country well it, apparently they built the south side of chicago too i mean it, you know you Hear, read stories about aldermen hanging out there all day before mm -hmm. going to do stuff. It was like it was a central hub of activity. Yes. Fascinating. Yeah, so that's what we've always been all kinds of people doing all kinds of things. 
including like movers and shakers that do things like, I don't know, fund the entire Seattle public school network. No big deal. I, I don't think I know. That. <laughs> Lou, I... Lou Graham was a famous madam in Seattle that uh, after a fire single handedly funded the Seattle public school department and like Seattle survived as a city because of her investment. See, and here's the great shame of history. The only Lou Graham I know is the lead singer of Foreigner, and that's not. Okay. Oh, that's yeah, that's no good. You got to listen to our you got to listen to our podcast episode. I think you would I, love I it. absolutely do. <laughs> uh, so you've been doing a one woman show, the Whore's Eye View mm -hmm. show. It seems like conceptually and just knowing what I know about Chicago, it seems like something that you could take here. I would love to take Horse Eye View to Chicago. I want to I mean, I want to take it everywhere, but we're uh, we're developing the show right now. It's at it's at QED. We're going to sort of ping pong around to a couple of smaller theaters over the summer and fall. But like as soon as this thing is ready, I, I mean, I felt cooped up for a year. I've been, yeah. say, you know, podcasting feels like screaming into an empty void. I miss people in a room so bad I can taste it. I would love to come to Chicago and bring bring Whore's Eye View. And it's like, it's getting pretty good. I love it. All right. So in the meantime, we can hear you. Uh, the oldest profession podcast. It's it's everywhere. Um, we can, uh, everywhere we can that you can listen to podcasts. Right. Uh, and I think you're doing really cool, fascinating, provocative stuff. And I Thank I'd, you. I'd expect nothing less. Uh, but I definitely appreciate you doing the show. I really appreciate it. I'll say, you know, we have a lot going on at Old Pro Productions, and the best way to keep up with it is to join our newsletter. Be in the know like an old pro. <laughs> uh, but so if people want to sign up, where do they go? They can go to oldproinc.com, the oldest profession podcast.com, Old Pro Project. It's look up our content, follow the links, you'll get to a newsletter link, and it all goes to the same place. Awesome. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you.